So hello everyone, thank you for joining us today. I am Dr. Michelle Villagran, the chair of the diversity committee for the San Jose State University iSchool. And I wanna welcome you to our 2020 diversity webinar series for our university faculty, staff, students, alumni, and affiliates and friends. This is the fifth webinar in our eight part series. And actually it's the first webinar for the fall semester. Uh, all of our presenters are sharing content around diverse topics, uh, which align with the goals of inclusive excellence, diversity, equity, inclusion, and social justice issues. You'll be able to find a full list of the upcoming sessions, topics, our presenters uh, on the link I posted within the chat on the upcoming webcast page. And also you will be able to see any of the past recordings. Uh, we are recording every session and you'll find those on the On Demand page and also on our YouTube. And we have a playlist just for our diversity webinar series. And there's the web, uh, podcast I will also mention if you prefer a podcast to listen to them there. So the session title is Equity, Diversity and Inclusion as Action, Designing a Collective EDI Strategy. And our presenter, which I'm so grateful we have her today joining us, is Pamela Espinoza de los Monteros, Assistant Professor, Latin American Studies Librarian, University Libraries, The Ohio State University. So now I will turn it over to you, Pamela. Thank you, Michelle. I'm, it's such a pleasure to be here. I wish I could see you all. Um, I'm, I'm delighted to be here and to present a tool uh, that was co-created with a good colleague of mine, Sandra Enamel, who is now at uh, Yale and is a copyright librarian. And we're hoping that you may hear something today about designing a DEI strategy with your staff that will help us meet this important moment as a uh, DEI and social justice conversations have been uh, brought to the forefront. So I just want to uh, share a little bit about who I am. Uh, so DEI has been a, a personal journey for me. I'm originally from Mexico and I immigrated here when I was very young. It's also been a focus of my academic training and I have really dedicated my career to, to advancing cross-cultural understanding. Uh, I've been privileged to find positions like some of the ones that you see here listed that almost exclusively focus on restorative and social justice goals. And these jobs uh, have allowed me to do a variety of things from uh, traveling exhibits on Mexico's biodiversity to coordinating concerts on the history of the blues. Here you see me uh, reading uh, a toddler story time. I've also done a lot of um, translation support to Latinx communities and also got to open one of the first deaf and hard of hearing foster homes in San Diego. And I wanna share with you that as big as these, these projects may seem, or um, I, was not, I was really ignorant to all things DEI when I first came to them. So people assumed that I was really culturally competent because I was an immigrant and I was Mexican, but that was not really true. Um, my identity gave me some insight into this area, but most of what I learned, uh, I learned by doing. And that's my main message for today. And the project that I'm going to share with you that was co-created was to support this, to support assisting people to, to approach DEI as action and to share some of the philosophies that uh, I picked up along the way. So diversity, equity, and inclusion, they're espoused values and acknowledge gaps of our profession. As early as 1920, the LIS community has sought to diversify its workforce um, in order to better reflect the demographics present in our institutions and our communities. And I'd like to start here, uh, if you can pull up your chat, and I'd like to ask for your feedback about what do you think diversity, equity, inclusion, and social justice work looks like in the library. So how, what does, what are some of the programs that you've seen or what does it, how does it actually manifest? So I'm going to give you a moment and if you want to put your answers in the chat.
Mm -hmm. Book discussions, staff. Yep. Program for immigrants, collection development, inclusive hiring practices. Yeah, featuring different types of authors. These are all great. Definitely. So we have we have a lot of different uh, we have a lot of different feedback about what what this can look like or has looked like, and I also like to hear from you about who do you think is doing the heavy lifting in this area? Who do you think is who do you when you think of equity, diversity, and inclusion work in the library? Who do you think at the forefront of of this conversation and this action and engagement? Then go ahead and put your responses in the chat. Yep, so I like that we are, we hope that it should be at all levels of the organization. And if you are just joining in to our discussion, we're thinking about who, who do we see most active doing DEI work in the library? And we're putting this information of, of who we think is at the forefront of these initiatives and activities in the chat. Yeah, so it's often people of color, minority communities. I, somebody said not specifically non-management employees. That's an interesting, that's an interesting. So great, great answers, guys. So it looks like we, we are on, we're on the same page. Um, so here, as we were talking about before, what, what, does, uh, what does DEI work look like in a library? And I want to express that many of us are doing this work already. It's already happening. So it can be anyway from instruction. Uh, it could be outreach to the community. It could be a cultural program. It could be activism for our dreamers on campus. It could be looking at diversity, and diversity in our collections. It could look at scholarship. And so many of us are actively doing this work. And also the values themselves are being, are being reflected in our institution strategic documents, the code of conduct, guidelines and search committees, uh, professional resident programs and training, and as, as many of you have said, you know, the importance of embedding these values and actions at the highest levels of our organization and all throughout. So here's another question. So we are doing the work, so, and it is being included into our, our guiding documents and charters. What do you think is holding this work back? So go ahead and, and and put some of your reflections in the chat. And even if you may not have a, a question right now or a, um, an answer right now, it's, it's something that I really would like for you to, to sit with for a while. So for those of you that, uh, that are joining us just now, we are looking at what are the ways that DEI work has been held back or what are some of the reasons that might be the case. So some people think it's uh, the power structures, uh, restrictive library policies, uh, we have lack of engagement by DEI by staff and leadership, we have lack of funding, too many people unwilling to acknowledge that there is even an issue, that apathy, that's a, that's a big problem. 
Some people don't want, are resistant to change, institutional bias, uh, lack of diversity within the field that definitely contributes. Not knowing our communities, yes. Too many people wanting to avoid conflict. Yep, yeah, these, this, I always say that DEI is a contact sport. <laughs> so you have, it's, it's not easy. So yes, like a, it's un, it can be very difficult work. It can make us very uncomfortable. So great, great responses. So it looks like you guys are also aware of what is holding us back. And as, as all of your colleagues have been saying, that despite the prevalence of these values and established initiatives, uh, decades of LIS research regularly conclude that there has been relatively limited progress in advancing DEI. So, and as many of you have mentioned, uh, there are several reasons for this. This is a very complicated question. I think we're also gonna try to see if we can share the chat so that you can see the responses from everyone because they're, they're very, very good. So we, we will definitely look into that. Uh, and, and as we were talking that this is a very, very complicated question. Um, and I'm hoping to address one area that may help. And again, I say may because this was a pilot tool that we, that Sandra and I started and it's given us results but it needs, it needs more data. So we need more people to try it out. And the main concept of, of the tool is to reframe DEI work as action. So one of my mentors always says that inaction is a form of action. And it's often missing in our DEI practice, uh, but why? So as we were saying, uh, DEI can take many forms. Um, as we were mentioning it, um, it comes in strategic documents. Um, but one of the areas that you see it more often manifesting in, in a library will be in some sort of a diversity committee, like the one that you see here. Uh, so the diversity committees are interesting because they're often the only library committee where black brown folks will be represented well, even overrepresented and put in charge of advocating for themselves, as well as educating their peers in areas that frankly most human societies have historically done poorly. And in these committees, uh, minorities metaphorically play the role of, of doctor, a patient, of diplomat, of public relations secretary, a press secretary, uh, their event planners, their human resource officers. And that's just in addition to uh, the actual job that they were hired to do. And in 2017, I find myself being this one man orchestra uh, and being one of these committee members. And this wasn't really unusual for me because as I mentioned before, I have been doing this work for a while, but also um, as, as, a, as, a, as a minority, I was often uh, that's told, not told, but volunteered into these spaces. Um, and there was a lot of assumptions made about my cultural competency, as well as my ability to represent Latinx communities that have often been exaggerated or imposed on me. And there was a myth too, that my presence in the organization could automatically transform the organization. So I use this metaphor of immunization and I wanna preference this that I know we're, t we're living in, in during the pandemic where we have become much more acquainted with these kind of images. But this was some metaphor that, that we were working with about two years ago. Um, and we were just trying to show that you could have the most cultural competent person in your organization, but if you only have a few of them, that's not gonna give you DEI immunity for your entire organization. So we need to look beyond the diversity pipeline, even though that is extremely important, but that's not going to solve all of our problems. And so here I found myself in 2017, I was doing the work, I was on the diversity committee, we had great success and, and the university libraries took a really progressive stance and they included social justice as part of their strategic plan. 
And the addition of social justice as a, as a new organizational value, it was received with very mixed reactions. Uh, some people welcome its exclusion because they recognized the libraries as a place where social justice was inherent. Others were really confused. They, they saw this term as very politically charged. Um, they struggled to see its relevance in, in our organization or their particular job. Uh, they expressed concern about eroding or diluting the true meaning of the phase if we fell short of meeting this goal. And so, and even though it was it was a, a, a big step and a risk for our organization to include this this organizational goal, you know, many of us left that meeting when it was announced, confused, um, really struggling to figure out how to define, identify, or assess what this value would look like in day to day practice. And I'll share I'll share with you um, how that ended up manifesting on that very same day. Uh, social justice was added into the organization, uh, there was another meeting that took place in which it was decided to sunset a very early digital humanities projects that digitally repatriated the Popo Vu. Uh, the Popo Vu is uh, one of the few pre-Columbian knowledge works that survived the conquest. It is the Mayan Quiche Book of Creation. And this particular project was really unique because if, as you can see, the social justice objectives uh, were, were exactly what the value stated. So we were digitally repatriating an object that was questionably taken from Guatemala and put in an archive uh, that the Mayan Quiche no longer had access to. It was providing online edition for Global South scholars that may struggle to uh, come to the U.S. to complete their research in an archive far away. And it was also helping to create new scholarship that was going to look at the document um, with a new epistemology. So rather than relying on previous translations that uh, where we didn't know as much uh, where the translations were wrong, uh, this was trying to support new scholarship and more than anything, we had a platform that was in an indigenous language, which even today, that's very uncommon. And this situation is not unusual to sunset a project like this. And there was a lot of factors. And I want to say that this was not based on malice. Uh, the factors that that were taking into consideration about how why this project we needed to put aside uh, were very real. We had a, a limited resource, a digital infrastructure that needed to be built on. Uh, this particular manuscript was not in our collections. We were just stewarding it. So some of the justifications were were not were they're applying criteria that we consistently use to think about what we what we do in the library because we can't do everything but you can see why it might be problematic when it comes to social justice projects because um, what justifications does a midwestern university have to support uh, the Popo Vu when there are no professors of Mayan studies on our campus, there are no Quiche students on our campus, there are no courses devoted to the importance of Mayan contribution to our society. And I just want to pause here and to let you know that today um, there, was, uh, there was a news article story coming out of South Florida where there is an 80,000 80,000 Mayan Quiche that reside in Southern Florida. And they are one of the communities that have been the hardest hit by COVID. Um, they have a 30% infection rate, which is extremely high. And so here's an opportunity that we as librarians can support um, some of the knowledge works that they find the most sacred. So when this situation happened, um, there was two ways to look at it. I can look at it as an individual event that happened to me personally, that's affecting me personally, or I could take a look and say, oh, you know what, this is, here is like a little alarm that's telling me that there is something going on with the structural inequality here. So most people are going to expect that DEI work is going to be stalled by overt racism, and that's still the case. 
Um, but it's actually something much worse, as many of you mentioned in your chat. It's often in action, it's inefficiency, or it's just plain apathy inside of a system that is not designed well to be equitable in including diversity. So are we going to continue to look at those gaps as individual incidents, or are we going to start addressing them at a greater scale? Will we change the underlying structures? And I want like to remind, or if this is because, because of everything that's going on um, in our society today, it's hard to forget that we're living in an era like no other. Um, where we can really design and redesign our systems and institutions to be more inclusive and more equitable. Systems that may have previously been designed to ignore, exclude, or at worst, oppress. Like this mural that you see on your left. This is one of the first points of contacts in the America. And it went terribly, terribly wrong. Uh, but we're not living at that time. The very fact that we have 90 people here today. That says all volumes. Um, what's, and it's other eras in the past have also noticed that we uh, have not been so equitable and inclusive to all communities. But our era could be different if we actually act on it and actually change these systems. But before we get started, we all have to get on the same page. Because we each come to the table with our own definitions for DEI terms, what they mean to us personally, how they influence our professional behavior. And when they're left undefined, these values are, are left to subject interpretations. Um, and that leads to situations like the Popo Vu. There is no set criteria yet for which projects we should do if they have social justice goals. And this is the problem. I, it depends on on what the different, imagine doing that in cataloging. Uh, we're going to approach cataloging based on our passions, based on what we think is important that day. No, that, that's not how it's going to work. And the same criteria needs to be applied to DEI practice. It's also really important to not make a lot of assumptions. Okay, we have the value there, and now people are just going to automatically know what to do. That's not really true. Um, and it also puts many of us in conflict with each other because those that are more DI aware um, are put in conflict with people that you know, they'll make this, they may not have thought the intersections of social justice and, and the library context. And in the, in, as a result, they render these values ineffective and meaningless. And it can cause a lot of misunderstanding. And it can cause people to just say, you know, it was just lip service. They didn't care. I'm, I'm not going to waste my time on this. So it's really important that we have explicit definitions for this, for these terms and that we know them at the individual department and organizational level. And somebody had a question, if my library does not have a strategic plan, do you think it's appropriate to find these terms in a strategic plan for a library or should they be defined, written in other places that shape the structure work of the library? This is a great question. And um, I'm hoping that the tool will be able to answer them. Uh, but it, it's, it's both. It, it, as you'll see with the tool, uh, the hope is that these values will be defined collectively. Um, so it won't be dependent on an administrator. It's not a top down, it's a ground up. I hope I get to it later. Jacqueline, if I don't answer your question, please come back to me at the end. So what do DEI actions look like in our profession uh, when we put them in practice? You know, well, that's really unclear. It's really unclear. Uh, when you're looking at existing LIS research, uh, the majority focus on gaps, perceived or documented in the profession, including issues of bias, racism, discrimination, and tokenism. And while this research is in incredibly important to build awareness, um, like the values, it has not translated into advancing DEI. So it's time to shift our focus. So this is something that we're proposing to shift our focus from problem focus to uh, solution focused thinking. And to look at addressing it at the systemic level uh, and to make solutions that are reproduci like reproducible by the average employees. 
And so the, the tools that we're going to address it, it attempted to do this. And I want to stop right now and talk about um, working in DI, as, and I'm sure many of you are doing this, so I, I may be preaching to the choir, but I just want to give um, a pause and a cheerleading speech of this work is extremely hard. This work has no infrastructure many times. If you get a no, you are on the right track. Expect many no's. Expect it to be bureaucracy, ridiculous sometimes, to have misunderstanding, um, to make a lot of mistakes. That is just part of it. Um, and it's really important not to um, internalize that failure and to kind of get really curious about it. Um, let's get curious about why didn't that work or you know wow like the way that i said it did not it was misunderstood or or that person's afraid of me now it, get, get into the habit of being really curious so that the more that we try through iterative attempts we're gonna get it right somebody asked could you walk through how we might balance efforts to include more uh, people of color at the same time of creating an environment that is actually healthy for them to enter. Yep. Um, so we're just not to bring folks into dysfunctional environments. Yeah. Okay. So this is a tough balance and this is why allies are really important. So uh, um, as a white minority, I have the privilege of of being able to walk into worlds. And one of the main things that I often do is I stand in front of my other colleagues who are tired, who have um, encountered terrible situations, and I don't make them, um, I don't put them in positions that are uncomfortable. But I, if with their consent, I do bring things up that for them, they are just exhausted. So here's an opportunity that the allies uh, can really play a big difference. And that's why the relationships between uh, minority communities and majority communities are, are extremely valuable here. I hope that addresses some, and, and I will definitely talk more about it as we go through the tool. So the, DEI, the EDI at OSUL initiative, and I'm sorry for the name, it's, it's a really bad name. We need to come up with another one. Um, it was really meant to help staff transition from discussing DEI values to embedding them through strategic action. And the, the objectives of the tool is to close the gap from values to practice, to set priorities. You can't, you can't solve everything, so you have to pick your battles you have to define what DEI is going to look like at the individual level, at the department level, and at the organizational level. And the very important message is that we all have to do this work. This is no longer something that only minority communities or people of color should be doing. And so the framing of the DEI as action informed by values pushes participants to recognize that embodying DEI values is not the same as adopting them as ideology. So look at the work. Don't look at what people say. Um, behavior can, is, is likely more to be changed with other behavior. You have to replace behavior with another behavior. If we continue to attack this through an ideology lens, which is ex still very important, it brings awareness, um, but it's gonna take a long time to get on the same page. Um, and we only have a limited amount of time. So if we're gonna give, if we have one hour and we're going to give it to a wordsmithing a values document instead of actually doing the work i don't know maybe we should do some work first and then write it up um, these are again my very personal opinions but I, I do think that we will we tend we can build bigger bridges if we have people doing the work first because the work informs the ideology. You can't go into this work with certain uh, perceptions and have it work out and, and continue with those perceptions. So the actual tool, so what is it? it it's, a, it's a workshop. It's designed by employees, foreign employees, to engage in meaningful conversations about their 
and, and about their practice in DEI and developing solutions for DEI challenges in the context of the organization. So we're looking at how we're going to fix where we live, our house, um, and the solutions that they themselves can enact. We emphasize that together we can address these issues and perhaps we cannot solve them right away, but we need to try. Um, and one of the things that we do is we try to bring these values down to reality. So, so what, how do they actually manifest in the library? So we used real life examples of diverse users uh, in our library spaces as an example. So it could be a student veteran with a traumatic brain injury seeking support for instruction, or it could be somebody in a wheelchair who's juggling their lunch at a library cafe where the space is not really designed for them. Or it could be an international student responding to an active shooter text. Or it could be a Muslim student praying with their backs to a glass wall, assuming they have privacy. And uh, what we were attempting to show is the breadth of DEI work in a library context, the variety of needs, and also to show that the identification in, my, in a minor, minority or majority group was not really going to be sufficient to respond to this distinct need. Um, you still had to do your homework. You still had to approach it just like anything else. And so here we're trying to relieve that dependency on, oh, it's a person of color, they'll know what to do. Uh, we also really encourage participants to look for solutions that are in reach. So um, starting small, and it's good, you practice that muscle. I mean, you're gonna pick up the weight, pick up the one that's appropriate for you until, until you, you, know, you have all of these muscles and then you can pick up all sorts of things. So it, but it's important to practice small um, and then you are able to tweak. And it's important to put your mask first. Um, it's a lot of self-reflective work and when you mask somebody else, when, when we see these images so often and that, you know, the, the mother with the child, it, it's a loving relationship that lets you support the other. Um, and again, this is, this is a delicate balance. We don't, we don't want to make people that are culturally competent responsible for educating everyone else. But what matters here is the relationship between the two people. So if, if, you dismiss people right away because of they said something ignorant or they, they um, dismissed something that was important for you um, and you kind of cancel them out. You lose the opportunity to try again tomorrow. But if your end goal is the relationship itself, um, your, your approach is going to be more long-term thinking. And again, sometimes you do have to be pretty rash. It's not about making people comfortable. It's just about prioritizing that long-term relationship because we all have to come together at some point for this to work. Um, the initiative also dispels the myth of DEI should be solely the work of uh, people of color, of DEI leaders, or a committee. You know, this is not something that can be solved by a committee. So we, and what's the underlining phenomena of that. It's that any perspective originating from isolation or a homogeneous group is going to fall victim to groupthink. So we need to be very comfortable working with people that hold different opinions that are different and we need to bring them to the table equitably. So it's not about coexistence of difference. It's about interdependence of an ecosystem that is sustained by the quality of relationships built between different types of people. And it's Definitely not about artifacts. Having the presence of, of someone who is a minority in your group does not mean that the group is inclusive. Um, it's really important that we, we, are, we recognize this, what inclusivity is and not just the inclusion of an artifact. So this is one of the first world maps um, made in Asia. And just to give you context, that big, um, that big middle part, that's China. Um, over there to the left, uh, which has like a, a black inner outline, that's Africa. Uh, Europe is almost invisible at the very top. And our hope too with our curriculum was to kind of show the importance of looking things through a global perspective. Um, so historically, when we talk about library and information science field and uh, DEI, we're looking at uh, we're looking at communities of, 
uh, Black and Latinx communities or Native American communities, uh, Asian American communities, uh, definitely people of color. Uh, but we also have to remember that there's other ethnic and cultural minorities in other parts of the world that are never going to be represented in, in a LIS pipeline or a library diversity and inclusion committee or even on our academic campus. And information flows are, are global and it's an, also an important component to, to consider when we're building any DEI strategy. So to resolve the dependence on minorities, um, we built a team, we modeled what that would look like. So we built a team of different types of representatives throughout the library that had um, different levels of cultural fluency, different experiences leading DEI. Some of them had never led a DEI effort before. Um, and they were from different backgrounds. So they were from minority majority groups. They were from different career levels. They were staff faculty. They were early career, uh, late career. They were tenured, untenured. Um, they were also from different library units, IT, HR, public services, technical services. And this was really intentional because when you walked into the workshop, we wanted you to see a DEI ally that you maybe you had never seen before. Maybe it was somebody that was in your department and you saw, hey, they can do it, I can do it. Um, and we spent a lot of time with our, as a team and, and training to do the workshops, um, to get the tone right, to get what we were trying to get across. And each of us brought really unique insight into this and that's what made it so special. So we were trying more than the than everyone here, what mattered was this equitable process that we built where everybody had a place at this table and everybody was contributing to one project and we all got used to working with each other in that way. And that's something that you don't commonly see, at least in our organization. So here's an example of a facilitator leading one of the workshops. They were offered to different units of the organization. Um, here on the left, you're going to see the agenda. So what ended up happening is that we had a set curriculum that was customized. Um, at the very beginning, the facilitator started by making themselves very vulnerable, talking about their journey to approach DEI work, talking about what diversity meant for them and expanding what diversity may mean. So we had people that were disclosing, you know, I have a medical illness or I've seen generational discrimination or, you know, I really messed up this one time um, doing a DEI offense. And, you know, that's really got me in, involved in this. Um, so, and, and we tried to set the tone, like we're all learning in this space and we're not here to teach you anything. We're here to have a conversation with you. Um, we had pre-assessment worksheets that we gave everybody, uh, which kind of helped the participants clarify some of the existing strengths and also some of the gaps and challenges that they had seen in DEI in different areas of the library. Again, specific to our library, so that they would be prepped to do some of the workshop questions. Um, when they arrived, they were put in different groups based on the question uh, that they would want to address. So there was four questions and each group was able to select one to answer. And there was, the workshop was divided into two sections. So the first part was the presentation. The second part was the actual discussion. And during the discussion component, we had them all come together and brainstorm solutions for each of these questions, then select two ideas that they really wanted to unpack and spend the rest of the time unpacking and, and kind of beefing up what that solution would look like. In addition to answering these questions, because um, that was one part of it, to collect their, their feedback, we were really just trying to make a space for our participants to build a common language about DEI and a collective DEI vision. So, we needed to make a space for people to practice. And as many of you know, this work is very challenging. And it's even more challenging if you think that what, from the moment you're opening your mouth, somebody is going to judge you. So here was an opportunity for us to give them a space to really, to really um, 
to try in a non-judgmental space and to also to, to model what those inclusive conversations a community of learning is going to look like and also to let them know that we wanted to hear from them also and contribute to this collective DEI vision. We asked everybody to reflect not on other people, not on what somebody else wasn't doing right, but what could you do from your particular role? And what could you do that you knew that you could advance in this area? And a lot of people were like, I don't know. I don't know. And that was really valuable information to, to, um, to have because it, it, it seemed like we need to practice this a lot more. Uh, we were also trying to broaden and again, to our message that broadening who could do this work. And finally, we wanted everybody to pitch in about prioritizing what should be our DEI goals and needs. So whenever you make a plan, the more that you have people participating in creating that plan, the more likely they're going to buy into it. So that was our, that was kind of our focus there. And also thinking that, you know, a, a group of, of different people from different backgrounds is going to make a much more uh, inclusive plan than if it's just a couple of people um, at the executive level. So here you can see um, what the brainstorming, we just used post-it notes for people to capture. Uh, the facilitators also played a, a very significant role here. They documented all of the ideas. We later transcribed them. And we also asked the facilitators to keep kind of like a journal of, um, of what happened during the workshops so that we could consistently be tweaking the workshop as, as, we, were going, as we were doing them. So a quick glance, we had uh, seven workshops, 114 participants. I think if I'm, I may be wrong, I think we have 200 employees. So that's, that's a pretty significant amount of uh, participation. We trained seven facilitators. I always said that this project was my retirement project so I could stop. Um, that hasn't been turned out the case, but I'm so glad that, that the organization has several different people that they can, they can talk to and pull from when they have a DEI project. And we collected 51 ideas. Uh, the data, I just want to touch base on the data, but I want to move on because I, I really would prefer to hear from you. Um, we, we took some of the ideas and we coded them. So we were trying to see uh, if we could quantify some of this qualitative data and we made up this schema, which is really raw. It needs a lot of help. But we were just trying to figure out where was, uh, how do people approach these conversations? What are the things that came out of our discussions? Uh, were there areas that people are more interested in others or more familiar with speaking to than others? And, and what were the, some of the target groups that they really wanted to support? And here's how, um, this is what they look like in the end. I will tell you that it wasn't as informative as I was hoping it would be. And for you that are library students, please, please, please um, explore data and DEI. It is a really underrepresented area in the literature. It is fascinating. Um, there could be so much more. And it would also help to uh, assess some of these uh, some of these programs that we do more objectively or to look at them in new ways. Um, so please consider that area. Finally, we took all of that information and uh, we curated all the data and we looked at the major themes that came up out of all of the sessions. So here are the major themes that came up. So we had professional development. Accessibility actually came out as the one that most people touched on and was the most common. Of course, uh, diverse multilingual collections. Uh, communication and transparency came out, which is not unusual for us because our organization is so large. And this is how we curated some of the responses. So we did really want to preserve anonymity so people would feel very candid in, their, in, in what they shared in the workshops. And I'm putting these two ideas here, so please feel free to steal them and, and to try them. Um, one of the things that we're most excited about is that our HR department is actively looking at incorporating explicit DI, um, 
definitions into job descriptions, especially any ones that are new, so that nobody has to think, okay, how does my job intersect with social justice or specifically what can I do? They'll know, they'll know, and it'd be tailor-made to their job. Um, we also made recommendations that we presented to the executive leadership of the organization, and I'm happy to say that many of them are now being enacted. Um, and it was just an opportunity to prioritize where we should, where we could direct our focus. And also as our, our organization makes, uh, or we make all personal goals every year, we could look at this as a menu and say, okay, I'm gonna work on that this year because we've decided that this is a, a priority. Um, I'm gonna end here because I really wanna hear from you some of the things that we noticed was that people really, it's hard for them to separate DEI challenges from organizational challenges. And that's not uncommon because DEI at its very core is, is good leadership. I would say that minorities, we're like Marines, we feel it first, but it's a problem for everybody or it can be a problem for everyone. And having people to, to think about uh, it was hard for some of our colleagues to really focus in what could be a DI challenge. And I, I think earlier on in the chat, that's what some people mentioned. They didn't know that this was a problem because it doesn't affect them personally or in their profession. And so that's something that we need to, to kind of unpack a little bit more. Um, a lot of people didn't see themselves, didn't see how they could advance DEI personally. They felt that they were not qualified. Um, they, they were it was easy for them to recognize what the problems were, but it was very hard to come up with a solution. And so here again, if we are depending on everybody to have cultural competency at the highest levels, that's gonna be really hard because that's like training a brain surgeon. Many of us are not gonna get to that level. So how can we make DEI actions that anybody can take? Um, and that's why look, looking at the system level is interesting because if you fix the system, if the system in itself mitigates for bias, um, is inclusive to diversity, has criteria that is gonna help a group of people uh, evaluate different projects, then it doesn't really matter what people believe. They're gonna, the, the system itself is going to um, get them on a conveyor belt and get them going in the right direction, um, just like it is right now, not doing those things. Um, and, and we also like broadening this definition of DEI to include age, invisible illness, um, mental illness, thought diversity, and, and even the hierarchies that, that are embedded in staff and faculty status, I think was really interesting because that, that really opened it up and made me pull people like think, okay, this is not just a minority owned space. Like I can be, I can operate here. Uh, so here are some quotes, but you know, that's okay. Uh, you can have these for later. And what I would really love to hear from you is what is your, what are your thoughts on this project? Um, this is one of the first times that we presented it outside of our organization. And we just wanna share um, your feedback, your questions, anything that might've come up for you. For those that did ask questions, let me know if I did not, if this presentation didn't address what you originally asked. And so I'm gonna stop talking now and hopefully get to listen from you. And while we're waiting for questions, I just have a few, I don't have any questions, but um, Pamela, I took a few notes. Um, one I think was really important that you stress is the need to define the terms because we all come to this space and this work from our own backgrounds, our own experiences and thinking about what one term might mean for me might be different for you or for your colleagues. So I thought that was extremely important and something I'm going to incorporate. And then also I loved your workshop questions and then really trying to dive into solutions and, um, Hopefully a lot of those were then put into place or practice, yep. um, which I know you, you talked a little bit about them, so I'm hoping those were, um, but I really appreciate some of those items. And I see now you have comments coming in, so I will jump off and we'll go to the attendees. Oh, great. So uh, did salary equity come up, in a, in, up as a topic in our workshops and report? Yes, it did. It came up a lot. 
and we did include those uh, and our in our organization our dean has done a, a a really good job at addressing some of at the faculty level and we have now are pushing it for the at the staff level but it was something that did come up and it was it did give us space to talk about that you know in a way that didn't feel uncomfortable um, because salary questions sometimes are you know, we shy away from them and also to talk about um, what's a solution for this a solution could be let's talk about how to do negotiations when you take a job um, so that's something that that also came up so here uh, from the Jess had a question from earlier um, about this balance to include more uh, people of color at the same time as creating an environment that is actually healthy um, so uh, Jess, I don't want to put you on the spot. Could could I ask you to to clarify your question? I'm I'm an oral I'm an oral person, so that will really help me out. Yes, I'm sorry. It's it's a complex question, and um, I realize that this is going to take a lot of you know figuring out with my own organization. But I, um, what I'm trying to to get at is like. Um, like what's, I, I hate to say like what's more efficient, but um, as someone who's trying to to take on, like you mentioned, like um, take on some of that emotional labor, um, yeah. what 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 is like more pressing or urgent or like what's more efficient? Um, my organization um, kind of has a little bit of a, a negative um, or neutral, um, <laughs> uh attitude toward dei right now and yeah. so i've 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 been trying to go to more and more webinars um i'm on our council for diversity equity and inclusion so i'm i'm trying to um make this into action and not you know i, d I don't want to just keep putting on diversity training after diversity training because that doesn't work mm -hmm. um but it's like at the same time, if I know that our organization's kind of a little negative or at the very least neutral or lukewarm, I don't want to bring people into an unhealthy environment. So I feel like I'm kind of stuck like between, well, but we need to make the environment good before we bring people, people in, but then we need to bring people in to make the environment good. So I, I just, yes. you know, work yes, through. Yes, that's the catch 22. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> Thank so, you. Yeah, no, that's a really great question. Um, I would say that we, I had this, I had a similar discussion because we have diversity residents in our organization. Um, I would say that it's important to be upfront to any person of color that you will bring in or a minority that you'll bring in and say, hey, we really need to work on this. And I have a commitment to support this area. Um, but I would really, but it, it is something that we're going to have to co-build together. And that means that the, there's going to be a lot of, of weight on, on the communities that are minorities, um, which they should, you know, it's, it's, it, it is um, something that we are used to, but it is something that has to be co-built. Um, and that the the idea is that the relationship, so that there's going to be friction is not the issue, but that they are that when we do have friction, we're committed to figuring it out. So I think that's what makes the biggest difference. Um, but it's it's not realistic to think that if we're gonna, oh the environment has to be great and then we're going to bring them in because if that's the case, I'm, I'm I'm assuming you don't have that problem. I'm assuming your your staff is already diverse. So, so I, that's a really good question. I, I would just keep trying to have those relationships, build those relationships and uh, start with a problem or a challenge that's inside of the organization, but that both, both the minority and the majority groups would benefit from it being resolved. Um, tone here is really important. Uh, you don't wanna wait till it's a big problem for it to have been addressed. 
So, and that's the purpose of this workshop is let's talk about it before there's a problem, before there are issues. So in the, in, in this case, you know, we could have just got really angry. And in fact, I did get angry about the popo, but the important thing is what you do about it afterwards and, and to make it into something productive. I hope that helps. And I'm happy to um, offline later, give you some more tips or get actually more feedback about what you might be addressing to, to, to kind of, uh, customize it to what you might need. Oh, I would love that. Thank you so much, Pamela. That that did give me quite a few um, starting points. Um, and I, I would absolutely, if, if you're open to that, um, I would love to, to reach out to you afterward. Sure. It, it'd be my honor. I'd be happy to. Thank you. You're welcome. So there's another question. Um, the presentation was great. Great start for me in which we just started a diversity group at the library. I'm so glad. Yeah, there is a lot of really good literature on setting up a diversity community, uh, a diversity committee. Um, so if you have any questions on there, I'm happy to point you to the sources. Um, Carly asks, I'm curious how this project was approved and supported by administration to even set aside the space and time for this. Okay, so here's the thing. I did, I asked permission, but I was going to do it anyway. So uh, here's something where you, you, I, I, I had the framework. I did have a conversation with my colleagues about one. It, it was actually Sandra NML that pushed, uh, pushed me to think about this at a bigger scale. And then we had a, a discussion with the dean, and we said we want to do this, um, and this is what we need from you. So we came in with very specific asks. And they took a lot of risk in um, because it was coming from a place where I was somewhat angry. So, <laughs> but um, but I was trying to turn it into something productive. And and to their, um, I really wanted to, like the support that I received was 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 wonderful. And and it was I think it has done a lot of healing um, and a lot and showed us how we can work together. So, um, but you know, you don't have to wait for the administration to say yes, you can do it in a diversity committee meeting, you could do it in your department meeting, you could do it on your own for anybody who wants to show up. You, it's not necessarily something that needs to be sanctioned, although when it is, it, it is very helpful. Um, Emma asked, our city's equity department has trained multiple library staff to lead DI workshops. However, these trainings keep getting canceled, rescheduled in favor of more pertinent needs. Yep, yep, any advice? Okay, so here's the thing. DEI is always something that is never seen, that that doesn't, oh, until it's a problem, it doesn't seem to occupy that urgency. And so I always uh, stress to people that to show up, like if you want DEI to work, you have to treat it with the same level of professionalism that you give to things that you deem important. Um, it's very, so that, that means that you give it your all. If you're coming to a meeting, you have an agenda, you have, you treat it just as professionally as you would anything else. And that kind of sets the tone that this is important. Um, but this is, this is something that often happens. And so I think it's important to have a conversation there and to, and to, and to come out like a, I like to do things with a nice white glove. So to say like, we're, we really need to keep these trainings because I already had 50 people that were gonna come and then it was canceled. So some things like uh, showing the merits of keeping it consistent without letting them know, hey, I know you're just not, you're not making this a priority. Um, Amy asks, I've been reluctant to make recommendations to hire people for roles specifically as DI specialists or accessibility specialists since this work uh, is everybody's needs to embed it. How do you expect the relationship to work between one hired expert and the whole? Yep. So I was a really resistant and this is when we decided to make this recommendation for a DEI officer, it's because some, it, it, the, the responsibility has to be coordinated through someone. It has to be somebody's job. So at that time, it was Sandra and my job, secondary job. And, and that meant that we were struggling because it would often be put aside for our actual job. So having an officer there, if the officer has the adequate resources that they need, if they are given a team, 
So like it's not coming in and oh you solve it unicorn librarian. No, it means that they come in and they have a council or they have a team or they have um, They have a budget. They have resources and that people work with them in tandem with them, but they're not leading everything. Um, we have a wonderful diversity officer at Ohio State by the name of Yolanda Cepeda and she is instrumental in doing many things on campus, but it's not her that is at the forefront leading them. You just go to her and say, hey, I have this really great idea and, and I would like to get a, a, your advice. And she goes, oh, sure, here. And she puts you in connection with this and that and she helps you with resources if she has them or she just helps you or she, she's just a, a, a voice of support. And that's what I was envisioning for that, that position. So it's more of a liaison like you would to a department rather than you're doing everything. If you want to read more, here is our chapter that gives more uh, context. Uh, please feel free to email me. I'm so uh, thankful for your time for, for listening to this. And I'd love to hear your feedback uh, as we continue to develop this tool. Thank you so much. And I'm happy to stay on and answer some of, the more, some of these other questions. Go for it. Uh, so um, Michelle, could you tell me what, where we are at in the questions, I think I might have lost my spot. Let me scroll up. There's so many questions. Great questions. Yes. Um, hold on. Um, can you speak about data in DEI and potential places to look for more research and information in this field? And also, can you reflect on how powerful or not your representation of data in DEI has been? Yes. So there really is very little. So a lot of the tools that try to do that, that try to quantify uh, qualitative data is actually proprietary. And a, there's one open source, like one open tool, but many of them are, are sold as a consulting uh, in consulting packages. And so it puts, librarians in a position that they would have to have the discretionary funds to purchase something like this. And um, I don't have them at the top of my head, but they're most likely used at public libraries. I really haven't seen an instrument or too many instruments that are available for academic libraries. Um, and so it would be thinking about just like social uh, scientists look at or, and, and, and specifically, I would say anthropology and sociology, can we adapt some of those tools to look at uh, DEI challenges in the library? Since, and what makes libraries an interesting space to do that is that we all have collections, we all tend to have instruction. So there are specific areas that are going to be similar to each one of us and um, thinking about how we can, and particularly for trainings, I think this is a really important tool to do a, a, a to do more assessments in that area. Like for me, I almost wanted in this presentation for you guys to send me little emojis when something actually helped. <laughs> like, so that I would know and, and things that were like, oh, oh, you're just talking, you know, I don't need to hear any of that. So, because I think when were those moments transformational is hard to tell. One of the questions that we asked um, was, what training have you taken that was actually helpful and transformative? very few people could answer that question. That's a, that's a problem. That's a problem. So um, yeah, I, I, I can send uh, Michelle in a follow-up some of the instruments that are available and, and just keep digging. You won't have to dig much because there's not much there. So here's an open field for you to do and, and a wonderful uh, you know, environmental scan for anybody in graduate school. Um, I see another one. I don't think you addressed this one. It's uh, someone commented, I've been reluctant to make recommendations to hire people for roles specifically as DEI specialists or accessibility specialists, since this is work everyone needs to embed in their work. How do you expect that relationship to work between one hired expert and the whole needing to do the work? That's a yes. relationship question. Yeah, so that was back to, to having that liaison. So it, it, and it needs to be expressed specifically that way. It needs to be expressed that this is not, this is not one person, it's, it's impossible to hire one person and solve it. In fact, if you look at DEI positions in most private sector, that's why they have such high rate of, of turnover because that it's impossible to do that. 
Um, I just also want to uh, do a, a quick show, uh, shout out to my, one of my key mentors is on this, on this webinar. His name is Jose Diaz. He is absolutely phenomenal. If you want a great, great um, advice, this uh, person, and he has a question too, that he says that did the issues of hiring retention come up as a topic in your conversation? Yes, they did. Um, we talked about how, why we were losing uh, people, minority leaders in the LIS community um, consistently in our organization. And that was one of the spaces that we could talk about it. And so one of our focuses was rather than, than trying to look at the diversity pipeline and, and diversity in our profession, let's start by taking care of the people in our organization first. And let's start asking what they need and how we might support them in, in ways that are not just um, checking in. So uh, one of the things that I, that we have come up with is like help them publish, help your minority colleagues publish. And this is something that specifically um, Jose Diaz really helped me. And so if he was not there to walk me through the process, all of these ideas that you hear, forget them. Nobody would know about them. So th this is just an opportunity to support your colleagues in that way. Um, maybe we can do it. two more questions. I see one here about, says, do you think the current priority should be invested in administrative and or legislative library level? This being to set a standard by creating mandatory workshops or trainings for all library and workers, whether permanent or temporary. I often feel there is a good amount of temporary employees who are discarded in the framework. That's a good question. Yeah. Um, so I think it needs to be addressed at both levels. Um, I think that when they come through administration, sometimes they might not be connected to what's going on at the ground level. Um, at the ground level, you have more opportunities to do experimentation that hopefully then will inform other levels. Um, and temporary employees are, are something that our whole profession really needs to think about. Um, term positions are, there, and there's a lot, there's a, there's, thankfully there's a lot of research there to support this. Um, but yes, yeah, so oftentimes like in a residency program, you get somebody in, they get trained into the organization and then they, they leave and a lot of their um, insights are not really retained in the organization. So there needs to be more mechanisms, not only to make their voices um, embedded into that organization, uh, but also to think about how we're supporting these workers as they are, um, as they're bearing the brunt of, of DEI and then, and then also kind of whisked away. I think we're getting much better at it, but there, there needs to be more conversation and more attention to those programs. And that's one of the recommendations that we put. And then how about this final question and then any others um, we can address after in the document. Do you have information on doing displays uh, that are geared toward minority communities? Oh, yes. So I had the pleasure of having um, Jill Barron do the the a screening of her of her documentary on on the on the the cataloging term of illegal aliens and, and part of that we had we invited student groups to come in and to tell us how they wanted us to support them and one of the things that they said is don't do exhibits just on Hispanic Heritage Month like I no I would like to see exhibits that highlight my culture, my history um, in a positive light, not in the light of martyrdom and conflict and challenge and discrimination. Um, so that, that's one way to do it, is to do more exhibits that are celebratory. Um, other exhibits that I have done is I've invited artists to come in and to, like a, they've taken a book and a book quote and they've made some artwork design and that is put on display. We've also done that with students. Um, there's really creative ways that you can approach exhibits. Even putting, one of the recent workshops that we've done is to kind of put 
a manuscript, like a, a traditional Western manuscript, with, with a description that's looking at the manuscript through an indigenous epistemolo epistemology. So that's a completely new, new way to look at these materials. Um, that might not be the best. I may not have addressed that question as, as well as I want to, uh, but if there's more, if you have a specific idea that you would like to flesh out, please let me know. And then one just came in, and I think this is an important one, and then we'll, we'll wrap it up. Um, how, important, how important is it to have written definitions of EDI or even EDI wording in the strategic plan? Um, I, I don't know if at that level it's if – you, if you put it – this is, again, my very personal opinion, so please – test it out and, and ask many other of your colleagues what they think so we get at the best um, answer. In my personal opinion, I think it needs to be done more at the, in, it, it needs to be like a pipeline up. So it needs to start at the individual level, then the department level, then the organizational level. And then finally, when we see how all of those things are working, um, place them into a strategic plan. Again, avoiding this top down strategy and better uh, bottom up and because uh, people that are in their positions they know better than anyone what they can and can't do what they may need is to sit down with somebody else and and have a dialogue about what are the intersections of these of these values in their day-to-day -day work and those need to be put into their job descriptions when they are when it's appropriate or even as a as a goal for that year, or maybe they're just guidelines. Um, I'm not. A, I'm not a fan of. Of uh, I'm again. I'm a fan of doing the actual work, focusing on the action rather than what it looks like on paper. Well, excellent. There's actually a comment I think that goes along with this. Um, one individual at their institution, it seems important to have DEI in the strategic plan because we refer to the plan to support our programs and actions. Mm -hmm. Yep. And so I think it's having that consistent conversation so that it doesn't turn into um, something that people don't know how it integrates into the day-to-day -day practice. I'm, I am, uh, after this, I will also send Michelle. So all of our, all of the documents that we wait, the, the curriculum, the handouts, all of those things, we are hoping to just make them, share them. Mm -hmm. Anybody can do whatever they want with them. Our, our hope is to just give people a starting point so that they may try this in their organization and see if it works for them. That, that is our hope. That'd be wonderful. It's almost like a toolkit for everybody to get started and to help them. Yep. Um, well, with that, I don't want to keep anyone much longer, but we really appreciate all of your questions for you being here today and truly to Pamela for the time and sharing her expertise and this, this wonderful pilot project. And it sounds like it's had some great successes. So I look forward to see all of the materials you send along that I can then share with everyone with the recording. Oh, I'm so glad. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michelle, for inviting me here, for everybody that's here. I also want to thank uh, Sandra Enamel, who really was a big part of this project, uh, along with Elaine Pritchard and all of our facilitators. So thank you so much. And um, I hope to uh, talk with some of you later on. <laughs>